heat waves, drought, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, blizzards, bitter cold. Extreme weather has an incredible impact on people across the globe. On Mount Washington, our scientists brave some of the worst weather on the planet to improve our understanding of our warming world. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Science in the Mountains. My name is Brian Fitzgerald, and I'm the Director of Science and Education here at Mount Washington Observatory. And joining us this evening to discuss the recently released 1991 to 2020 climate normals are UNH Associate Professor and New Hampshire State Climatologist, Mary Stampone. And in addition to Dr. Stampone, we're joined by the Observatory Summit interns, Michael Brown and AJ Mistrangelo, along with weather observer, Jay Broccolo. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's program. For those of you who aren't already familiar, the Mount Washington Observatory is a nonprofit member supported organization whose mission is to advance the understanding of the forces that create Earth's weather and climate. And we do that uh, through, through a few different ways by operating our summit weather station around the clock with weather observations and forecasting by conducting research and product testing projects and developing and offering innovative educational programs. If you have questions for tonight's speakers and you're joining us on Zoom, please make sure you use the Q&A button and you can find that at the bottom of your toolbar down in the middle of your screen. We're going to be able to collect your questions throughout the entirety of today's program and we'll have some time at the end for a live Q&A session, so make sure you get your questions in as they come up. If you're joining us on the live stream on Facebook, welcome. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we won't be able to respond to your questions in real time during the program, but uh, we'll do our best to make sure our summit staff can follow up right after the program and respond as quickly as possible. If you'd like to connect through Zoom for upcoming programs, make sure you register over at mountwashington.org slash SITM. All righty, so let's kick things off by launching a poll. And we're going to mix things up a little bit tonight. For those of you who joined us in the past, we'll do a few different polls this evening just to make sure you're sticking with us throughout the program. And I'll go ahead and I'll launch our first First poll, and for those of you who have uh, participated before in Science of the Mountains are always curious where folks are joining from this evening. So go ahead, if you're joining through Zoom, you can participate. Uh, if you'd like to participate in polls and you're on Facebook Live, just make sure you sign up for Zoom next time. But we're curious what region of the country or maybe outside the country you're joining us from tonight. Quite a few of you all around, either from the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Midwest, Southeast, Southwest, Northwest, and outside the country. And then we're curious, since we are a uh, a nonprofit and member supported organization. We're always curious uh, who of you are continuing to support us as members and make sure we're giving you the recognition you deserve. So uh, go ahead, just uh, take a few more seconds here to allow you to uh, participate in these two questions and I'll end the poll in about, well, let's see, five, four, three, two, one. All righty, let's see what we got here. Overwhelmingly, the Northeast is well represented, about 84% of you. Thanks so much for joining, but we are represented all over, including by one person from outside the country. Welcome, welcome to the top of Mount Washington. We're excited to share our summit weather station with you. And then for everyone joining, wow, the majority of you are currently members of the observatory, 69% of you. Thank you so much for your continued support. It's a such an important part of the observatories. Uh, revenue and funding throughout the year. Uh, and without you, we certainly could not uh, exist. So thank you very much. And for those of you who said, no, you're not at the moment, but you'll consider joining over at mountwashington.org later on. Thank you so much uh, for supporting us. Alrighty, so I will stop sharing the poll just for the moment. And sorry, I realized I was not sharing the results with you in case you're curious. There are some of the results. But we will move on to our, uh, our actual program for the evening because we want to hear from our speakers tonight. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing that. And uh, without further ado, let's turn things over to our first speaker tonight. So I'd love to welcome Dr. Mary Stampone. Mary, uh, can you hear me okay? I can see I, you. I can. Can you hear me okay? I can. Hey, well, take it away. We'd love to hear 
all about uh, your work and certainly your understanding of the new normals. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, as Brian said, I am Dr. Mary Stampone, and tonight I'm going to get us started by defining what a climate normal is and to provide some context for interpreting changing weather patterns in a changing climate. So first, let's start with some background. Uh, New Hampshire's climate is characterized by four distinct seasons, and this distinct seasonality supports a diverse natural landscape that's adapted to the extremes of cold, snowy winters and warm to hot, humid summers. So at daily scale, New Hampshire's weather is highly variable and capable of producing severe conditions, including extremes in both warm and cold temperatures, as well as precipitation, resulting in floods and drought, which as we saw this summer can occur at the same time. So additionally, uh, several major storm tracks cross New England, placing New Hampshire in the path of blizzards, thunderstorms, as well as the occasional hurricane. So to put all of this daily ups and downs of weather into perspective, we often compare different types of observed weather, like temperature, to the type of weather we expect for any given time of year. So for example, early August here in New Hampshire is in the middle of summer, so it is reasonable to expect the weather to be warm to hot across the state. So this expectation for what is normal weather is kind of our own way of understanding um, or characterizing climate. So Brian, if you wanna pull up the poll question for me, So what we're seeing here in the map is the distribution of the daytime high temperature across uh, New England and Northern New York for yesterday. So consider what you think of as normal for early August afternoon temperature in New Hampshire and compare that to um, what the observed temperatures were. And so if you get a chance then um, record what you think um, or how these compare to what you think of as normal in the poll question where um, was afternoon, did the yesterday afternoon seem normal, cooler than normal, or warmer than normal? And we'll get that a few more seconds here. All right, Brian, it looks like we're good. Okay, so high temperatures in the upper 70s to low 80s statewide uh, seems normal to most of you or some of you. Um, and then there's also quite a few that responded with cooler than normal and then a few as warmer than normal. So this kind of this uh, differences in opinion on what normal is, um, is mostly because what we individually think is normal weather for any given place and time is usually based on some combination of history, personal experience, and when that experience occurred, um, along with what it feels like at the moment. So therefore, what we all think of no as normal is usually subjective and varies from person to person. So in climate science, we quantify normal using the statistical average and range of weather variables like temperature observed over a specified time period. So a climate normal represents the current climate of a location based on the average of weather observed over the past three decades, which right now is the average calculated for the period of 1991 to 2020. So with that in mind, we see here that the daily high and low temperatures observed at Concord, New Hampshire, which are depicted by the blue bars in the middle of the graph, they have a normal range from an average morning low of 58 Fahrenheit to an average afternoon high of 83 Fahrenheit, which places yesterday's high temperature at Concord of 82 Fahrenheit, just below the normal daily high, but still within the normal range for August 9th, and well below the record value of 98 Fahrenheit observed in 2001. So now depicting 
climate as just the statistical average of weather can give the impression that climate is kind of static and that normals don't really change. But just as weather changes, climate changes, albeit more slowly, and resulting climate normals change with each new decade. For example, we can take a look at how the average normal value for maximum temperature on August 9th changed over the 20th century through present. So again, here the blue bars represent the daily temperature range observed at Concord on every August 9th since 1901. For the maximum at the top and minimum temperature at the bottom. So the current normal daytime high temperature of 83.5 Fahrenheit is approximately one degree Fahrenheit warmer than the average daily high for the 81 to 2010 normal period, and almost two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the 1971 to 2000 normal period. Now going back even further, the normal high temperature for August 9th at Concord over the first three decades of the 20th century was 79.3 Fahrenheit, which is over four degrees Fahrenheit cooler than what the normal is for us at the turn of the 21st century. So this observed shift in the August 9th normal high temperature not only quantifies changes in weather, but is indicative of a change in our climate. So this NASA animation shows global warming since the late 1800s as the difference between each year's annual average temperature and the 20th century average. These observations, which were collected from around the world, show how global average temperature increased in response to the increases in human source greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. Now, while warming rates, you know, they vary regionally, obviously, um, but the observed rise in global temperature over the past 50 years was actually faster than that observed over any point during the past 2000 years. So as global temperature increases over time, the value and or frequency of warm daily temperatures observed at individual locations also increase. So when averaged over decades, like the August 9th temperature example, the climate normal range slowly becomes warmer. Shifting that normal range toward higher values makes abnormally warm weather, including extremes, more likely to occur now than it did in the past. Now, of course, cool to cold weather will still occur here in New England um, as we get into a warmer climate. But the energy retained by additional greenhouse gases in the atmosphere caused our climate to be overall warmer than it was a century ago and affects precipitation amount and type, as well as the frequency and severity of weather patterns. So now overall, the state average annual temperatures are already three degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they were when records began in 1885, 1895. And as a result, the 1991 to 2020 state average normal temperature um, is significantly higher than the early 20th century normal for average annual temperature. Now, along with this increase in annual average temperature, the last decade had the greatest number of days with a maximum temperature above 90 degrees Fahrenheit and the number of nights with minimum temperatures above 70 Fahrenheit exceeded the 20th century average since the mid 1990s. Now moving on to the cold season, the greatest seasonal warming that we've seen here in New Hampshire and New England as a whole has occurred in the winter season, which has had nearly five degrees Fahrenheit increase in the average seasonal temperature since 1900. With this normal winter weather, also warmed significantly, resulting in a decrease in the number of nights below zero Fahrenheit and an increase in the number of days above freezing since the mid 1990s. And then in response to warmer winters, the onset of snow melt now occurs on average about five to 19 days earlier than it did compared to uh, the mid 20th century. So all of these warming temperatures have cascading impacts throughout the climate system and into our weather patterns. 
So like temperature, precipitation is also increased statewide with an increase in total annual precipitation of about eight inches statewide since 1900. These changes are attributed mostly to an increase in the amount of precipitation produced by individual storm events and an increase in the number of extreme events that have occurred since, again, the 1990s. Uh, beyond the amount of precipitation, um, precipitation type is also changing in winter, where we've seen an increase in the proportion of precipitation falling as rain to in part in response to the milder winter temperatures that we've seen. So to summarize, um, the larger pattern of human-caused global warming has caused New England region to become warmer and wetter with an increased occurrence of both warm and wet weather extremes. Increasing summer temperatures increases the loss of soil moisture to evaporation and plant transpiration, which then in turn increases humidity in the air, providing the fuel for heavier precipitation and associated runoff and flooding, and can also lead to more intense drought during dry periods. Then milder winters have already led to decreased snow cover, a shift toward more precipitation falling as rain, and a longer frost-free season. So monitoring these changes is critical to understanding not only the connection between climate change and weather, but also for their impact on New England's economy and quality of life, which can include impacts such as reduced snowfall and winter recreation, increased heat-related injury and illness, as well as the spread of invasive species and diseases. Right, so if you are interested in learning more about the topics I kind of touched on today, um, I have a list of really great references um, that are available free to the public. Um, and I specifically would recommend um, looking at the Northeast chapter here in the uh, 2008 climate assessment. There's also the NOAA's climate normal page, which is um, a place where you can get a lot of the normal data that you saw here, as well as the latest ICC or IPCC report um, that was actually released yesterday. So those are all available to you online and all resources I would recommend for more information on climate change. So with that, I am going to now turn it over to Jay Brockle, Mount Washington Observatory Weather Observer, to introduce the observatory's normal project. Hi, thank you, Mary. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, we really appreciate that. And now, just to bring it in a little bit closer to our local environment, um, our interns, uh, Alex Brandon, Michael Brown, Madeline DeGroot, and AJ Mistrangelo have been working very hard and diligently this entire summer um, on this project, comparing the current climate norms from 91 to 2020 to the 1981 to 2010 climate norms. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce Michael Brown and AJ Mistrangelo to present this wonderful presentation to you all. Thanks, Jay. Hi, I'm Michael Brown, and let's jump right into this presentation. So to give a brief overview of what this presentation will cover, we'll quickly give an introduction to our project scope and why we chose the project that we did and our motives behind it, as well as explaining the stations that we selected. And then we will get into our data and methods, where this data came from, how it was compiled, um, what it means to us as researchers in training and as researchers as well, and how we are presenting it in our charts and key facts area to you guys to explain possible trends and interesting notable, um, notable things that we have found. And then finally, we'll give you guys our synopsis and our discussion about any possible trends in future work that we'll need that we believe should be done. Hello everyone, my name is Adrian Mastrangelo. Um, so for the project scope here, we're gonna be finding and comparing our old and new climate normals uh, with the NCEI releasing those climate normals at the end of 2020. It was a, a interesting year to kind of dive in back to what we've seen in the past and compare it to the present. Um, so for this project, we decided to choose three sites in the Mount Washington Valley. Originally, we uh, chose the summit of Mount Washington and then North Conway as kind of a summit and valley approach. But then after further analysis, we decided to add in Pinkham Notch as well, kind of as a middle ground station, uh, not exactly elevation based, but certainly gave us some good data from there as well. 
And then lastly, we're look, we looked for this project to uh, relate our findings to global climatological trends. While these are only one increase in normals and there's a lot more data out there to analyze, uh, we certainly have some good ideas and some uh, interesting trends that we found uh, with our data set. So to give a brief introduction to our station, starting at the top of Mount Washington at the Mount Washington Observatory Station. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, there's a relative location graph showing the summit of Mount Washington in relation to the Pinkham Notch and the North Conway Station. Now over on the right, we have some pictures about our observations and the station itself up here, how we collect our precipitation and our temperature data, as well as the station itself and kind of a picture of the instrumentation You'll, you would see on the tower if you came up and visited. So now I'll introduce Pinkham Notch. As you can see with the, uh, our graphic here on the right, uh, Pinkham Notch is located um, within close proximity to Mount Washington, uh, but is quite far from North Conway. Um, Pinkham Notch sits in between the two um, other sites at 2,025 feet. And a notch is a narrow, deep mountain pass. And as you can see from our graphic here, it sits in between the presidential range and the wildcat range, certainly giving people some interesting weather there at Pinkham Notch. Um, Pinkham Notch is also a co-op weather station, uh, which uses digital thermometers as well as handheld um, devices for precipitation measurement. And now looking down to the Mount Washington Valley at North Conway and our North Conway station, um, it is located at about 5,000. 522 feet compared to Pinkham Notches, about 2,000 feet, and the summit's about 6,200 feet or so, give or take. So on the left-hand side, you can once again see where the station is located in relation to the White Mountain Range and the Presidential Range, as well as the other two stations. And on the right-hand side, you can see, again, another uh, picture of the instrumentation used. Um, they, all three stations are very similar in the fact that we all are co-op stations. And we all collect data in a very similar manner. So it made for a great comparison when looking at the stations. So now I'm going to ask Brian to launch our poll question uh, regarding which station do you guys believe had the largest annual increase in temperature, average temperature rather, between the 1981 data set and the, two, and the 1991 data set? Yeah, happy to do that. Would you mind sharing your slide full screen so we can get a better look at uh, all the different stations there? Thank you. And I'll go ahead and launch that poll for everyone for about a minute. So if you're joining on Facebook Live, the question that's being asked here is, in this investigation, which station saw the greatest increase in normal annual average temperature, Mount Washington, Pinkham Notch, or North Conway? And we'll give it just a few more seconds here. We'll get some good participation. And I will end the poll in Three, two, one. All right, we'll share some results out. I don't know if uh, Michael, you can see, or AJ, if you can see those results and what everyone picked there. Yeah, so we'll certainly take a dive into that uh, in, after our data and methods portion. Uh, we'll share some of the data we found. Um, we'll see what you guys think and if it lined up with what we found. So now for our data and methods portions of this project. Um, this is just an example here, I'll go full screen for you guys, um, of some of the data we collected from the NCEI. This is the summary of the monthly normals uh, for temperature for the 1991 and 2020 for the NCON 3 station. There is a whole lot of data here, but the data we focused on, at least for temperature, was the daily maximum, the daily minimum, and the mean temperature. Uh, we did this for several different data sets regarding different parameters and uh, variables um, for our project. So now we're going to take a quick closer look at the NCON station, for example, just to show you guys what data we collected and what data we used in this project. So I'm going to just go full screen for you guys. And as you can see, this is the 1981 to 2010 uh, climate normals data we collected for the NCON 3 station at North Conway. Uh, over on the left hand side, you can see our snowfall, uh, liquid equivalent snowfall, snow depth thresholds, precipitation, uh, minimum temperature, maximum temperature, and overall average temperature by each month, as well as you have annual averages and totals at the bottom. So for example, on the left-hand side in that first column, you can see that there was about 80 inches of snowfall located at the NCON station for the 1981 data set. And if you look over to the second to last column, the average temperature for the 30-year period measured in this set was about 43.8 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So now moving on to the Pinkham Notch or to the 1991 data set where AJ will be explaining what was different and how it was measured. Yeah, so this is just an example of the 1991 to 2020 uh, temperature normals or for the, the entire normals for the NCON 3 station. Um, as you can see, some of these numbers are in fact different as Mary was alluding to earlier in this presentation. Um, certainly what we found was interesting and Michael will now go into some of the deltas or the differences that we saw amongst one of our stations here. Yep, so again, looking at the North Conway station, this graph is now representing the differences between the 1981 set and the, two, and the 1991 data set. And as you can see at the Anacon station, for example, with the temperatures, the left or the rightmost three columns, they were all increases, meaning that there was no negative values measured at this station. However, if we take a look at the precipitation uh, row right next to the minimum temperature, there was pluses and minuses for each and every month. It was not just a consistent up or increase or general decrease in terms of the rainfall measured at the station. So for example, there was an increase of about 0.1 inches in January for liquid precipitation, but going right into the next month at February, there was a decrease of about 0.1 inches. So again, those variations are what we are looking at in terms of this project to see what has changed and what hasn't in the last 40 years or so of data. So now we'll get into some of our infographics here that we made for our project. Um, so these infographics, as you can see, I'll share it full screen here. In the um, black lettering, we see the um, average, the, the normals from 1991 and 2020, and then to the right in several different colors regarding changes, either positive or negative. Uh, we see the changes that we saw between the 1991 and 2020 and the 1981 and 2010. So um, I'll take a look at the Mount Washington Observatory data here. Uh, most notably, right when you guys see this, the, most, the thing you notice first is on the left column, the high temperature did increase in every single month. However, the low temperature did decrease in some months, but overall the average temperature uh, annually, as you can see down here at the bottom of the chart, did increase by 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So the temperatures did not really see uh, as great of a change as we saw with the precipitation. So if you look over to the middle column here of the precipitation, you see many months uh, out of the year with decreases in precipitation overall. Most notably, November was almost two inches under than the previous normals. So that gave us an annual average precipitation difference of about six inches almost um, here at Mount Washington. Also, snowfall was relatively uh, modest in its changes between the normals, uh, only increasing by 0.6 inches. Then the snow depth thresholds, however, were a little bit interesting as we saw some of the greater snow, snow depth around 5 and 10 inches over 10 days uh, were increased during the entirety of the year for that station. So now I'm going to take a look at the Pinkham Notch site and the same type of infographic that AJ was just sharing with you guys. So I'll just go back full screen for a quick moment as I explain to you guys what this data represents. So over on the left-hand side, we have the temperature data. In the middle, we kind of have our precip and snowfall data. And then on the right-hand side, we have our snow depth data representing four different parameters in terms of the amount of snow. So starting off with the average high temperature for Pinkham Notch, the average high temperature actually increased by about 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the average low temperature actually decreased overall annually by about 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit over the last two climates normal data sets. But this resulted in an increase of about 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit overall for the average annual temperature in the 1991 data set. And now looking at the precipitation, there was about a 4.8 inch increase in terms of liquid precipitation at Pinkham Notch, meaning that the 1981 data set was actually drier than the 1991 data set. And finally, looking at the snowfall, um, the snowfall data that we collected, there was 9.7 inches of an increase measured in between the 1981 and the 1991 data set, um, which is very interesting considering that the general consensus among the public is that warming climate means less snow and more rain. So that was a very interesting find we saw in the data. So lastly, we'll take a look at the uh, NCON 3 station here. Um, for those of you who saw, who answered the poll, uh, our average temperature did increase the most here at the NCON 
free station. As you can see at the bottom here, the average temperature increased by 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means it increased the most from the normals. Um, and then in second place was Mount Washington. And then in third was Pinkham Notch. So just again, this is a relatively uh, small data set. So doesn't mean these changes are exactly what we've been seeing in the climate um, for the entirety of the of data or time that we've had here. Um, but certainly North Conway did see those increases in high temperature, low temperature and average temperature with not one month going below um, the averages from the 1981 and 2010 data. However, precipitation in, at the North Conway station was more modest in its changes with several months going above and below um, the, the, average, the differences between the data sets. And then that averaged out to about 50.1 inches of precipitation, which was only about half an inch uh, more than the previous data set. Snowfall, uh, similarly to Pinkham Notch, did increase a little bit, going from 80 inches to 84 inches between the two data sets. And then those snow depth thresholds did increase as well, just slightly by a few days for each threshold. And alluding to what Michael said earlier as well, um, it did not correlate to higher temperatures leading to less snowfall. So um, that was certainly an interesting find as well that we saw with the NCON 3 data set. And now we will continue with our charts and key facts. Starting at the Mount Washington Observatory data, this graph is just going to show the changes uh, in a different way that we measured. So going full screen, uh, this green line shows the temperature change, whereas the blue line represents the change in liquid precipitation. And the yellow bars represent the change in liquid equivalent snowfall. Now, liquid equivalent snowfall is another way to measure snowfall. It just, what we use is called the 10 to 1 ratio, which takes about 10 inches of snow and equates it to about one inch of what would be melted out as water. So that is just another way scientists and researchers across the world use to measure snowfall. So now diving into the graph, you can see there was a general overall increase at the summit of Mount Washington in terms of temperature. Only about two months, February and April, saw a temperature decrease, whereas the other 10 months, specifically in August and September, where there was an increase over about a degree, had uh, increases in temperature. Uh, that is just showing the general warming trend that has been noted across the world, the nation, and as Mary was alluding to, the state. And now looking to the precipitation, there was a general decrease actually in precipitation in terms of the um, liquid, the liquid precipitation rather. The biggest deficits were, were recorded in October um, and into the early and mid portions of the winter, whereas we saw slight increases in summer during the May, June, July timeframe. And finally, looking at the liquid equivalent snowfall, this was a bit more of a varied trend where it did not really match with the seasonality pattern. There were increases and decreases across the board. Uh, I'll just point out that there was an increase in February, but there was a, a decrease in January, kind of showing that varying trend and lack of a clear pattern for us to identify. So now I'll talk about the Pinkham Notch site. Uh, not, not quite as similarly to what Michael was speaking about. We did see decreases and increases in temperature here at Pinkham Notch. Most notably, we saw those decreases in the uh, end of winter there in February, March, and April, and even into May as well. But then as we got into the heart of summer and into early fall, we saw those uh, temperatures increase by about one degree for a couple months there. And then certainly were a lot more varied for the rest of the year as well. But that really averaged out to about uh, not, not too much change to be seen here at the Pink of Notch station regarding temperature. Uh, precipitation, on the other hand, was quite the opposite from Mount Washington, which we were also surprised about. Uh, many months uh, out of the year seeing increases in precipitation by around half an inch, and then certain months such as October, uh, as well as December, seeing larger increases in precipitation uh, due to what Dr. Stampone was talking about with stronger storms as well. Um, certainly Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Irene, storms like that uh, have had copious amounts of rainfall fall here in the Mount Washington Valley, uh, which has been noted here at Pink and Notch. Uh, and then lastly, talking about the snowfall, we did see some uh, varying snowfall. Um, it was increased slightly over the time period. Um, most notably, we saw those increases January, February, March, towards the latter half of the snow season there. Um, certainly some interesting trends regarding that and precipitation. Um, and I'll take it over to Michael. So finally, looking down to the North Conway site, 
a similar type of graph once again. And the immediate trend that stands out on this graph is the overall increase in temperature. In fact, only about one or two months out of the year saw an increase of less than one degree, whereas every other month saw an increase of over one degree with some months eclipsing two degrees of an increase. And the liquid precipitation, uh, the liquid precipitation actually increased um, very slightly overall. Uh, there was a general increase over the summer months and into September and October, or November rather, while general decreases were measured in October into the latter half of the winter season between February and March so far. Um, in terms of liquid equivalent snowfall, this is where a slightly different story takes place. There's a slight increase towards the end of the snow season at uh, the data in February and March specifically, whereas in November and December, there was a slight decrease in the amount of snowfall recorded at the North Conway station. And once again, as AJ had mentioned previously, this was the station where we recorded the largest increase in an average annual temperature between the two climate normal data sets. So now we'll kind of talk about our discussion points here. And our first discussion point is the elevation based uh, temperature changes that we saw here in the Mount Washington Valley and the three sites that we uh, discovered. Um, certainly here in Mount Washington, you can see at the top, Pinkham Notch in this valley, and then we originally started in North Conway as well. Um, those elevation based changes originally, a uh, study published by the Mount Washington Observatory in 2005, uh, was thinking that the higher elevations were seeing uh, climate change or uh, temperatures rising faster than uh, the surrounding lower elevations. But then a later paper and published this year actually uh, corrected that saying that the higher alpine has been seeing more modest changes than the lower elevations have been seeing those increases in temperature. And while we don't have really conclusive evidence for this here, uh, our data does line up with the second of those studies as well. Um, certainly with NCON3 increasing the most out of the three stations. And there's a lot to look at with this uh, discussion point. Certainly the increase in population here in the North Conway area, as well as certain aspects of the seasonal uh, population growing there as well. The heat island effect, I don't know how many of you have heard of that, uh, certainly could be attributed to that as well. So now heading into a possible shift in the snow season, I will put this full screen so you can see this graphic better. Um, looking at the differences in snowfall between the three stations across the two climate normal data sets, this line graph where green represents the Mount Washington Observatory, yellow represents North Conway, and blue represents the Pinkham Notch site, you could see uh, the general um, trend in the snow season and the snowfall differences between the two sets across what we call the snow season, which is typically July 1st through June 30th compared to the calendar year of January 1st to December 30th. Now, looking at the beginning of the snow season, there was a slight general decrease in terms of the um, difference between the 1981 and the 1991 data set. But once you approach the January time from January through March, there was a spike in the snowfall recorded at all three stations in the 1991 data set, meaning that there was a positive increase in terms of the snowfall. And that trend continued on into the latter portions of, of the snow season until they stabilized around April and May, receding back to the normal values that were recorded in, in the 1981 data set. So what this is really showing is that there was a possible shift to, of the peak of the snow season with increases in January, February, and March specifically at these three stations in terms of their snowfall. Now we'll take a look at some of the precipitation extreme and drought extremes that we've been seeing here with our data sets as well. As Dr. Stampone mentioned earlier, we have been seeing stronger storms, but we have also been seeing stronger droughts here uh, and across the uh, global trend across many places as well. I'll put this full screen for you guys here. Uh, in the blue, we have Pinkham Notch, and then in the orange, Mount Washington, and in the green, North Conway. So what you can notice about this graph originally is that most uh, of the three stations do have similar trends with dips in certain places and increases in certain places, but the magnitude of these dips at, at certain places are a lot different than others. And that can be attributed to several different things, which we can't really conclude, but certain things like coastal storms certainly giving more moisture toward the eastern half of Mount Washington with the October uh, precipitation increasing 
vastly at pick and notch, but then the summit not really seeing that increase as well. But then there's other months such as February, March, and April where these, um, where these values were much close together and these precipitation extremes were not as noticeable as well. And then there's also months such as August where we saw a drought at all three locations uh, most notably Mount Washington, uh, which saw under an inch and a half uh, difference from the previous normals as well. So certainly there's a lot to digest here and analyze, but that's just some of the information that we found regarding some of the precipitation extremes here with our data set. So now heading into our future work section, what we would like to do with this data and going forward into the climate and how this impacts the environment, as Dr. Stampone had mentioned earlier, because we are living in an ever-changing world. Starting out with a possible shift in the snow season, as I had talked about before, there was varying research conducted in terms of the snow season actually shrinking overall, as well as the snow season just transitioning earlier or later in various parts of the globe. Now, there are many studies conducted in North America, specifically in Northeastern US or surrounding regions. So that is a very interesting trend that we would like to examine is the increase in snowfall between the, mar the months of January and March. Um, and then next, our next point is possibly the impacts of the adiabatic processes and the rain shadow effect here on Mount Washington and how that's impacting the local climate. Has there been a shift in how these processes impact the rainfall, the temperature, and the snowfall amounts recorded at the local stations? And how can these pr processes be predicted or perhaps changed by different um, ideals or processes, behaviors of both humankind and of natural um, origin. So now I'm gonna hand it off to AJ to discuss the next three. Yeah, so for our growing population, the heat island effect on the NCON3 data is certainly another interesting topic to expand upon. The population of Conway has increased by about 4,000 uh, since back in 1980. And this population could have an effect as the heat island effect kind of warming temperatures there as well. Our NCON3 site has also moved three times, and not drastic moves, but certainly could be attributed to different locations of the site there, increasing temperature as well. So further studies could be conducted, whether or not the people or us are changing that data or whether it's just changing itself. Uh, next, we have stronger winds possibly correlating to less snowfall or in precipitation on the summit. So the Mount Washington Observatory has actually broken two monthly wind records in the past three years. So for our precipitation can that sits on the eastern side of the summit, um, we do have the stronger coastal storms blow right over the precipitation can with the strongest easterly winds of the storm. So whether or not that precipitation is traveling right over the can or not, there certainly is more error associated with um, the increase in wind speed there. And that certainly could be a topic that people could talk, could research further to examine in the future. Lastly is the different storm tracks. So are the storm tracks shifting as Dr. Stampone was also talking about earlier, uh, as they did in the previous 30 years from the new normals. So that's certainly another interesting aspect of this project that uh, could go a lot further from what we've searched. And uh, certainly there's a lot more throughout this entire project that could be concluded in future work. So here are our references. Um, we do have these available uh, at some point to you guys, and then we'll, that'll be it for our presentation. So we'll hand it back to you, Ryan. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, AJ, Michael, Jay, thanks. Mary, thank you as well. Mary, I invite you to turn your camera and mic back on because I know we have some questions from the audience and I would invite anyone else who has some questions, comments that you'd like to share now is a great time for joining us on Zoom. Please use the Q&A button that you can find right down the middle of your screen. Uh, and I know we already got some great questions lined up for you. Uh, lots of folks curious about um, both presentations for sure. Um, and maybe we start, hmm, where should we start here? Well, it, it was an interesting question that came up from Ken. Ken asks, it's a question we get quite a bit relative to wind speed and precipitation. I know both of you just mentioned that one of those things you would love to look at, I guess, even from a storm by storm scenario, what types of storms and weather events uh, lead to different types of precipitation. Um, I don't know if maybe you can speak to that a little bit more and even Jay, I, you know, whatever you might be able to interject from just the different types of storms, wind directions and wind speeds and generally um, 
what that means, I guess, even for the confidence of the precipitation data and the consistency that's collected up there. Um, yeah, so, I mean, precipitation is definitely a hard thing to record uh, when the winds are high. Um, I think uh, really what AJ and Michael are trying to, to, to say is that the precipitation data recorded at Mount Washington is difficult because of the high winds. So it'd be really interesting to know if our winds, if our average wind speed has also increased over this time. Um, regarding uh, storm tracks, it, it really depends. It, uh, that would be a frequency of storms and really our wind direction, where our wind direction is coming from, where our precipitation is coming from. Um, th those are really the things that we question on uh, precipitation. And also like is the placement of our can the, the prime spot for it? Um, depending on wind direction, we do record different amounts. Having said that, observers here are trained um, to judge precipitation based on visibility uh, rates. So whether the snowfall, um, you can see through the snowfall distant miles uh, gives us a relative amount of snowfall. Um, so we are trained in certain ways, but yes, there is there's a decent amount of error with precipitation recordings, at least on Mount Washington. Certainly, and if anyone out there can design a better precip gauge for the top of Mount Washington, please get in touch. We would love your ideas. Um, Mary, question for you, uh, sort of related to, I guess, you know, specific weather events, because I know we're talking about climate here, but, you know, we're talking about average weather equaling sort of our most recent climate. And I have a great question from Eric, who's, you know, thinking about this from the, the math and sort of averages perspective, you know, we have overlapping data here that both AJ and Michael looked at. We're looking at the 1981 to 2010 uh, data set and the 1991 to 2020 data sets there's a lot of overlap and really all we've done here is we've taken out the 1981 to 1990 data and now we've added the 2000 teens essentially to the data set. Mary, I don't know if you can talk to generally speaking some of the you know the decadal changes you know from the 80s to even the the teens you know what sort of types of more frequent weather events we saw in the region. Well basically what we're seeing is an increase in the frequency of warmer than average temperatures. So with each decade, we shift, right? Those averages are getting warmer for temperature because temperatures are rising. And in fact, the uh, last decade um, was the warmest decade on record here in New Hampshire, Northeast, the globe. And so that's you know kind of what we're seeing with the averages. We're taking out a cooler decade and replacing it with a warmer one. And so it's just incrementally getting higher. And um, you know, and when you look at it kind of over a long period of time, so not just, you know, this climate normal period overlapping with the last one, but if you look at the ones now versus, you know, mid-century, early 20th century, we do see then significant changes, um, that changes that are kind of outside of the, you know, uncertainty range you get for things like station location moves or instrumentation changes, or even the urban heat island effect. Those, you know, once you get above the, the two degree Fahrenheit sort of uncertainty, um, that's when you're seeing real change that's being reflected in these normals. Right, so, and, and from what I'm hearing, and I know from just having worked with our interns here, you know, certainly the, the standard, we look simply speaking, you know, these, these two sort of mostly overlapping data sets, you might look at, one 30 year chunk and then another 30 year non overlapping chunk to really see some of those longer term changes. Um, but even so staying on that thread just for a second, AJ and Michael, I know you spoke about it a little bit um, from even just say the precipitation uh, changes that you saw a little bit and thinking a little bit specifically about, you know, the big October changes that you saw. What were those uh, those weather events, the types of weather events that you're thinking of in those 2000 teens, you know, the sorts of things that increase you think increased precipitation if you had to look through the numbers? Yeah, so warmer temperatures, especially in the air and in the water as well, do, do kind of feed into those stronger storms, especially at the end of the Atlantic hurricane season. Those storms have more juice when they come up and ride right up the coast and come into our area. So those storms are happening, as Dr. Stampone was talking about, with more frequency as well. Uh, certainly, the, as you were talking about, the tail end of the summer season is the peak time for that as well. Um, and just overall, even just cold fronts in general, uh, throughout the entire year, we're seeing, we're, we are seeing a lot stronger extremes that Mary was mentioning. Um, certainly, there are more isolated 
events such as the summer, you do see um, some isolated, stronger thunder thunderstorms. Like for example, um, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire this year, we've seen a lot of precipitation uh, just from uh, countless rounds of thunderstorms this year. So it's certainly a, a location by location aspect to it. But overall, we are seeing some of those ocean storms uh, correlating to or meet, lining up with some more intense precipitation uh, readings that we saw with our data. And just to add on, um, some of those storms that you may be familiar with are Hurricane Sandy, for example, that struck in October 29th, 2012. So that is in that new 10 year period that we looked at. So that could have certainly had an influence on the precipitation data specifically that was recorded, especially on the eastern side of the mountain range. Yeah, and even just think about uh, what was Tropical Storm Elsa as it moved up through the coast this this year, certainly the southern half of or the coastal, more coastal portions or southern half of New Hampshire, certainly seeing quite a bit of rainfall, breaking J July records. Um, but Mount Washington really being the cutoff there, not not so much necessarily. Uh, Mary, I have a, a question uh, also from Eric, uh, who is asking a little bit more about, the, uh, you referenced the Concord Station, Concord, New Hampshire, of course, being our, our capital. That is, you know, from my understanding, one of the kind of uh, go-to climatological sites in the region. Um, <laughs> Eric's curious, I mean, a little more specifically, you know, it's recorded at the airport. He says, where was the, de the data coming from a century ago? I guess more broadly, I'm kind of curious, you know, why, why Concord? Why some of these other sites that we pick out climatologically as sort of like the baseline sites around here? Well, Concord is one of the best maintained sites in the state. And so, um, and again, like sticking kind of with what the National Weather Service uses, um, that's sort of the, the, that's the representative station for New Hampshire. Um, but that is a little bit of a different station than kind of the workhorse weather stations that we use for our climate record, like the one at North Conway, the co-op station. So those are not automated um, and they're not by airports. Uh, and so like there's one here in Durham that I maintain that's actually part of the historical record, goes back to the um, 1890s. Uh, so, um, but yeah, Concord is, is just a nice station to use um, because again, it's central to the state and it um, has a very good record. Um, a complete record and so um yeah it's a useful station and um you know so there has been moves in that station location just like any weather station that's been around for more than five ten years they usually move around sometimes um but uh again the changes that we see in the temperature record again exceed uh sort of the instrumentation uncertainty as well as that urban heat island effect it's you're seeing the global signal in it. It's matching also, I would um, note that there's a consistency among stations. So even though that one is located near an airport, we're seeing the same types of changes in other stations nearby that um, don't have that urban influence. So the, the, the change is real. Uh, relatedly, the station moves, uh, and actually, AJ, Michael, I know you were curious about this when you were looking at all your stations that you selected. John's curious about the North Conway co-op station that's just located down the street from here. Uh, was curious if there was an overlap period between the station location moves that, you know, might have had an impact on temperature that maybe you were considering. So our, da our data didn't really dive into too much about that station uh, movement uh, as much as what we saw um, amongst the other stations, because the other stations have been in the same location uh, for the entirety of the data sets we used. Um, certainly, Brian, I think you might know a little bit better regarding that NCON 3 station and where it's moved. I don't think the moves have been too drastic. I think the last one was uh, just down the street as well. So I think it's more, I, I think I, we can't really gauge what the impact of that is from the movement. Um, and that's why I think it's a great point for future work. I mean, whether or not this, moving of the station is causing these increases that we saw or whether or not it's the uh, urban heat island effect that Dr. Stampone was talking about or just other factors as well. So we're not entirely sure about the uh, movement impact there and certainly more research would help with that. Certainly, yeah, and for, for moves that are more significant than down the street and uh, around the corner, uh, I, I believe that's in, correct me if I'm wrong, Mary, that's where co-op station records will actually become a brand new station that they consider that just sort of a brand new site and and sort of starts a new record over. Yeah, there's a standard for um, distance and elevation changes for a station. If it goes beyond a certain radius um, or elevation change, then it just starts a new record. Great. And so speaking of standards, and we have um, uh, Marty here who uh, 
caught a very important point that was actually on our on uh, AJ and Michael, your figures. This is something that came up because we asked ourselves the question, uh, certainly when we were reviewing data here. All right, so we saw temperature shifts from these overlapping 30 year periods. Uh, and on your figures, I don't know if you're willing to go back to one of your uh, figures there, showing that uh, a little note, the National Weather Service standard for temperature bias or the acceptable sort of error range being plus or minus two degrees. That's an important point to talk about because while we didn't run confidence statistics here, what does that mean for the data here? How much, I guess, you know, confidence might we have to say at least within this data set that the, that the temperature isn't just up to, you know, random chance, I suppose, or instrument error. Yeah, so due to that fact that we did not really conduct uh, statistics on this data set, we can't say for sure or make any definite conclusions, but these are NWS standards that they put out for all their stations. They all have to meet certain requirements in terms of their errors and what they are actually reporting. So all these stations are obviously certified and their data is certified by both the National Weather Service and NCEI when they looked at it. And because of that, um, while we do have to note, obviously as credible sources up here, we do have to note that plus minus two error, there is possibly a shift that is not just due to error, but we cannot say that for sure. Great, and so it, another question actually for the summit and, and maybe Jay, I might throw this to you. Uh, Aline's curious, you know, I saw the, saw the terms rain shadow, maybe their adiabatic effects, those sorts of things in the mountain. I know AJ and Michael, you, you, you both looked at stations that were from the mountain and then moving more coastal. I'm curious, Jay, I mean, talk a little bit more about that. What would be your hypothesis, I suppose, if we were to look at other stations that were surrounding Mount Washington, what might we see relative to rain shadow or adiabatic effects? Yeah, so uh, that was an interesting uh, theory that they came up, or not theory, uh, hypothesis that they came up with seeing uh, why Pinkham Notch experienced so much more precipitation. Um, because we are on a mountain, air moves vertically and, and horizontally through the air, but when you take an air parcel and it moves up in the atmosphere or sinks, um, that air parcel can expand and contract. And within that air parcel, the temperature can change as uh, moisture is released and or uh, condenses in it. So understanding the pressure at these stations um, in the future work would be a really interesting um, project to see exactly how adiabatic processes around Mount Washington have changed over the years. Yeah, certainly there was a temptation to look at a lot, a lot of state uh, stations all around uh, the mountain here, and we were we we're thankful to have uh, the time that our interns were able to give us to search through all this, but a lot, a lot more to certainly be explored here. Uh, I have a question that maybe, I don't know, maybe throw this to you, Mary, uh, from Patricia, who asked an interesting question. Um, Patricia says, I live on Cape Cod. I feel the summer humidity has been increasing during my 40 years of living here. Is there any data that researchers are looking at at humidity specifically over time? I, I know we didn't cover humidity specifically here, but uh, anything you know about humidity over time, Mary? Yeah, it is one of the variables uh, that researchers are looking at and um, just physically as air warm, it can hold more water. So we see an increase in humidity generally with warmer temperatures if there's a source of water. So like out here, we have plenty of sources of water. So when it gets warmer, it tends to get more humid. Um, but uh, humidity data are um, not as available as temperature and precipitation or even snow. And um, those data are pretty much limited to uh, those automated stations that you do see at airports. Uh, so the data are kind of messy and a little difficult to work with. So that's why you don't see them studied as much as you see temperature. But there are researchers that are looking at that. And some of the satellite products actually provide some good uh, data on um, some more recent data on humidity. Great. And, and even sort of more, more simply, Mary, uh, Tim asked a question, uh, AJ and Michael, I mean, even you, Mary, showed data on daily average temperatures. How is that generally determined? What's that National Weather Service standard for how an, uh, a, a daily average temperature is determined? Generally speaking, it's the average of T min, T max, the so maximum daily temperature and minimum daily temperature. Uh, some of the stations that are automated and take hourly temperature data, uh, you will see um, 
the average be the 24 hour or the 24 temperature average. Uh, but for, for research purposes, we do um, a standard average of T min, T max. Great, yeah, because I, I suppose not all stations have that wonderful 24 hour data or people going outside every single hour to measure temperature like on Mount yeah, Washington. Like Mount Washington, you've got the 24 hours, but at North Conway, you don't. Exactly, yes, and actually, thank goodness, because I can only go over there once a day. That's all my time all that's for. All righty, well, um, thanks. I know we have more questions uh, that have been left here, and certainly for those uh, questions we didn't get to tonight, I would strongly recommend that you do follow up uh, via email over at education at mountwashington.org. Feel free to follow up with one of the Zoom follow-up emails. If you have some questions uh, that weren't answered here, we'll be updating the observatory's website with not only the recording from this program and so the, some of the presentations that were shown this evening, but certainly uh, some more uh, findings from AJ, Michael, uh, Maddie, and Alex's project from this past summer. Uh, and we'll be sharing out those, those figures and those interesting findings from uh, their project this year. So um, thank you to our speakers for joining us this evening. And while I have everyone, uh, everyone's attention, uh, I hope that if you enjoyed tonight's free program, we would strongly hope that you would become a member of the observatory if you're not one already, or donate to help support programs like these over at mountwashington.org. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, feel free to follow up using the Google Form survey that will show up in your Zoom window following this program and also in our thank you email. And don't forget to join us for our next Science in the Mountains program. That's on Tuesday, September 21st, a little ways away here, where we're going to have the University of Maine Assistant Professor Aaron Putnam, who's going to join us to share his fieldwork investigations looking at past glacial periods in order to help us understand what the future of our warming climate may have in store for us. So don't forget to register for this program and watch any of the previous programs you may have missed over at mountwashington.org slash SITM. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Mary, AJ, Michael, and Jay. Hope you all have a great night. Thanks again, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks all, have a good night. Take care.